This is the nature of things. Fruit might just be another item on our grocery lists, but for fruit hunters, it's a lifelong obsession. They know that there's a world of exotic fruit beyond the supermarket. That's why they traverse the globe in search of rare white-fleshed mangoes, succulent ice cream beans, and mind-altering miracle fruit. One taste of these hidden treasures is enough to change your life forever. But it's not all fun and guavas, as the fruit they collect might not be there the next time they visit. Fruit hunting is more than a hobby. Sometimes it's a lifelong mission. We all have an indelible fruit memory, the perfect strawberry, the first bite of a crisp apple. But some people are completely obsessed with finding, tasting, and saving exotic fruits. They are the fruit hunters, and after entering their mysterious world, you won't look at fruit in quite the same way again. Fruit hunters range from backyard growers to professional horticulturalists to just plain obsessives. Tropical fruits just are more varied than any other food that we eat. From the very pungent, strong taste of the durian to the sub-acid sweet taste of the langsats and the longans and the lychees to the richness of the mangoes, it's a real cornucopia of flavor. Been to Malaysia, Singapore, Puerto Rico, just to find the varieties of the fruit trees. I never really got into growing it until I was a little bit older. I think the connection fruits with people for me is very basic. It's senses, something that makes people happy. It's a connection with their own roots. I've traveled throughout Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, the Cook Islands. The thing about uh, fruit collecting is that there's no end. And if you have friends overseas and they give me a call tomorrow, I'm on the plane to find. <laughs> Before long, it became an obsession and uh, I was no longer a normal person. It blossomed into a full-time case of insanity. What compels a fruit hunter to drop everything and travel halfway across the world just to taste something new? Fruit is a powerful seducer. It's designed to be. At its most basic level, a fruit is simply a part of a flowering plant's reproductive system, the way it spreads its seed. Fruit lures us in with scent, shape, and color. That's because it wants to be eaten. When an animal or a person eats a piece of fruit, the seeds pass through the digestive system, spreading its genetic material far and wide. What other food desires us as much as we desire it? Fruit hunters know just how deep our love affair truly goes. It's a symbiotic relationship that goes back to our deepest origins. Our early relationship with fruit helped make us human. We co-evolved with fruit. In the jungle, our eyes began to distinguish between green and red. That process continued as we realized we could change fruit and started growing and breeding new varieties ourselves. Through the development of agriculture, 
Fruit was now within reach. We didn't have to search for it in the wild. We could settle down and focus on a mutual goal. Abundance. It worked. But the end result is that we traded variety for convenience. Fruit is now bred for shelf life and to withstand long journeys, for profit, not taste. Today, you can walk into a supermarket and buy the exact same fruit anywhere in the world, any time of year. The food industry calls it permanent global summertime, year-round abundance but at a cost. Fruit has become predictable, plastic wrapped, and bland. But not for those who have dedicated their lives to finding the wonderful and exotic. It's always fun uh, going and, and introducing new fruits, new cultivars of mangoes. Some of the world's most passionate fruit hunters can be found at the gatherings of the Rare Fruit Council International. Get a little this way, because you're blocking the fruit. You're blocking the fruit, can you believe it? Oh, that's good. This durian traveled from halfway around the world to be with us this evening. This will taste like almost like um, eating vanilla ice cream. Smells like an outhouse. No, don't listen to him. <laughs> well, obviously, people are pretty opinionated about this fruit. <laughs> you can buy that part frozen. Another older mango from Hawaii is Excel. This one actually came from the selection program at University of Hawaii. Uh, Hamilton selected this mango. Very, very good. Richard Campbell and Norris Ledesma are horticulturalists and professional fruit hunters based in Florida. My definition of a fruit hunter is when you see something, you taste it, you have to have it. Yes, it's blooming. I can feel that yes. right there. Hey. You can lose yourself in the passion of anything. That's what really makes it so exciting. That's very good. I love that side of fruit hunting. Richard and Norris travel the world, searching for rare and often endangered fruit to identify and preserve in their tropical fruit collection. Very good. There, look at the mangoes. Oh, look at the mangoes. Very nice. La legiwe. Mango madu, no? This is a... Sweet. Sweet inside, right. Fruit hunts often begin not in the jungles, but in the markets, like this one on the island of Borneo. Richard and Norris work backwards, tracking the fruit to its source. I show you the... In a map? Okay, how to get it? This is the main road. Okay. You just go straight along this way. Okay. Relying on the cooperation of locals, Richard and Norris hunt down their elusive prey. Ah, so this is a tree that you have? This is? <laughs> so take us to see this tree. Tutum, we see. Tutum, we see. Anybody can see it? Oh, yeah. There's, 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 there's small fruit. Mango. Right above my head, there's small yeah. fruit. No, but we can take a picture of the flowers mm -hmm. to identify it. When they find a suitable candidate, they collect genetic material from the tree. Not the fruit itself, but healthy branches. They'll bring them back to Florida to grow in their conservatory at the Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden. It has one of the largest tropical fruit collections in the world, 
with over 1,000 varieties. Its founder, David Fairchild, an explorer for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, was a legendary fruit hunter. At the turn of the 20th century, Fairchild traveled the world searching for exotic specimens. He brought hundreds of new species home. Some of these fruits were strange, like the miracle berry, a magical fruit from Cameroon that transforms your taste buds by coating them in a special liquid. One bite of the berry makes anything sour taste incredibly sweet. But David Fairchild is also the reason we eat popular fruits like mangoes, nectarines, and cherries. As the senior fruit curators at the Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden, Richard and Norris carry on his legacy. Their connection to fruit runs deep. I grew up with my grandmother and my uncle. My mother was working in another town, and I see her just once a year. Fruit for me had been everything since I was a little. In my country as a Colombian, we eat fruit all the time, probably since my mom was pregnant. My bones are made with bananas, and my flesh is mango, and I really feel it that way. When I was in kindergarten, my teacher sent home a little thing that said Richard wants to get a PhD and collect tropical fruit when he grows up. And basically that's what I did. My dad was a great horticulturist. I would consider him one of the greatest horticulturists in this hemisphere. Fairchild is basically a, a Noah's Ark for tropical fruit. You know, you could play devil's advocate and say, what does it matter to save all this diversity because there is this economic crunch in the world right now? I would use an argument, um, does it really matter to save the Mona Lisa? What's the point to save the Mona Lisa? There's a lot of paintings out there. He did a whole bunch of paintings, right? Okay, I mean, so what? Just another painting. Well, that's true to most people starving in the world don't care about the Mona Lisa, but there are a lot of people that do care because if that's lost, it can never be regained. I would look at our genetic collections in that same way. You can never regain the Pura Vida if it's lost. The Pura Vida is a Mona Lisa. It's just an avocado, but it's a Mona Lisa. I work with mangoes. That's my life. We have 600 different mangoes. That's unique. What is unique? Something that is going to disappear and your children are not going to be able to see it. Richard and Norris arrive in Bali to track down a rare Southeast Asian mango. To start their expedition, they attend a fruit ceremony, blessing the new harvest season. They've spent almost two decades attempting to bring back and grow the white-fleshed wani without success. The wani is a wild mango. It is one of the elite species of mangifera. There's over 60 species of mangifera that people eat, all right? If they succeed, the fruit might one day line supermarket shelves. But first, they're going to have to hunt for it in the markets and jungles the of best, Bali. The best chico that we've seen. As we co-evolved with fruit, it became part of us, from our rituals, our history, 
and even our earliest memories. It's hard to say where I first became interested in fruit. I can remember going to the circus with my grandfather and, and the people were walking around with, uh, with cones of cotton candy, spun sugar. And it's the first time I tried uh, Inga or ice cream bean, I just, God, this is just like cotton candy. I can remember my grandfather, I, it, ta it takes you back. A lot of the fruit takes you back to those memories. Every variety of fruit has a story. The story of the person who cultivated an individual plant and then shared something wonderful with the world. Rudolf Haas was a Pasadena postman who planted an avocado tree in his yard and now Haas avocados are grown and sold around the world. In an Algerian monastery, Father Clément Rodier cultivated a sweet citrus fruit that would eventually be named after him, the Clementine. A grower in the American Northwest, Ah Bing, cultivated a sweet and flavorful cherry before finding himself barred from the U.S. following the Chinese Exclusion Act. But he left behind the Bing cherry, one of the most popular varieties of cherries today. When a variety of fruit is lost, a story reaches its end. Our natural diversity is diminished and we lose a piece of our history. In the fertile hills of Umbria, Isabella Dalla Ragioni searches for lost varieties of fruit. When she reclaims one, she preserves a piece of the region's history. Mio babbo era una persona che veniva da questi luoghi e ha, ha assistito alla dimenticanza, alla smemoratezza delle, delle persone negli anni 50-60. E dunque lui ha cominciato in qualche modo a pensare di raccogliere anche queste, queste piante eh, che erano state eh, straordinariamente importanti per generazioni di agricoltori. Continuing her father's work, Isabella maintains an orchard of lost fruit. It's a living library where she preserves rare and forgotten varieties. Sometimes, her work takes her deep into the region's history as she hunts down fruit depicted in art or literature. Wealthy Renaissance dynasties like the Medici and the Buffalini would commission paintings of their agricultural holdings. Isabella identifies the fruit in these artworks and searches for the plants they're based on. Some of them are still alive, even after hundreds of years. Appunto, ieri abbiamo, abbiamo visto sto fico lì al Castello Bufalini. Oddio, allora c'è un fico color stranissimo che io non l'avevo mai visto. Beh, sono piccolini, hanno sofferto una siccità. Però è una bella ficaia questa, eh? Sì, sono quattro. No, ma era giusto per, per capire no, se era li, quello. Li Isabella looks for leads by speaking to knowledgeable locals. No, dunque parliamo del... Magari in qualche monastero, visto che i monasteri erano così 
importanti per la conservazione della frutta. Sì, buongiorno, sono Isabella Dalla Ragione. Ah, sì. Del Fico, sì. Sì, grazie. Le volevo dire che appunto avevo fatto questa ricerca tanti anni fa. Secondo me è anche molto importante che si trovino le piante poi connesse con, con la gente, no? Con questo discorso dei... Monasteries and convents were often the sites of advances in fruit cultivation. Older monasteries are like time capsules for ancient varieties. Questo è diverso da quello là, eh. Eh, 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 eh. vedi? Eh, guarda qua. Guarda. È, è così, è così. Co come se fossero se già secchi. Proprio così. Ecco. Oh, vedi? Ogni tanto scopro qualcosa. Eh sì. È vero? Grazie. This humble fig might have been eaten by the dynasties that ruled Renaissance Umbria. When Isabella recovers it, she opens a door to a nearly forgotten past. Perhaps we'll one day eat it again. Questi frutti, queste piante, sono di fatto la nostra anima, quello che siamo stati. E, e dunque salvando questi frutti salviamo anche la nostra memoria ma anche la nostra anima. But there are places in the world where the fruit connection hasn't been lost yet. Where diversity is still a part of people's daily lives. Richard and Norris are in Bali in search of the Wani, otherwise known as the white-fleshed mango. They search the markets of Pangzan for the Wani with the help of their local guide, Budi. Once they find the white-fleshed mango, they'll have to trace it back to the tree. Where did you get these mangoes? It is from the... Uh, from, from the... the suburb of the town. Alright. Yeah. Do you consider Wani a mango? Wani? Do you know Wani? Menurut Ibu, Wani ini kan termasuk jenis mangga nanti kan? Mangga di sini apa? Tapi mangga putih di sini. Wow. Regarding to her, Wani, that is part of mango, but she said that is the white mango. That for you is the white mango. Right. Right. And do you like it? Ibu suka Wani. This has the consistency of a pear, yet the flavor of a guanabana. Mm -hmm. It has the milkiness, it has everything else. I like the acid. It has a little bit of an, of an acidity to it, so mm -hmm. it's good. Why the, the Balinese they still have a wani, like in their backyard? Because it's, the tree is nice. They have a good scent to their property. When the, the tree is getting older and older, the, the taste of the fruit will be sweeter and sweeter, nicer ah, and nicer. Ah, when they're getting older. When they're getting older oh. and older. The skin of the fruit, you know, will be changed, okay, to be like a darker color and a little bit wrinkle around. The taste of the fruit is much better than when we have just a nice skin like this. Don't say that to a woman, though. <laughs> <laughs> Up until now, we don't even know how to graft a wani. A, a wani will not graft onto anything we have. We cannot attach a piece of a wani tree yeah. to our mango trees. They won't live. So what we are, what we have spent 15 years, 20 years trying to figure out how to do is to successfully bring a piece of this tree, the wani, back and make it live on something that we have growing there. We now think we know how to do it. Grafting is an ancient technique where a branch or budwood is joined to another tree of the same species. Supported by the tree, the grafted branch will eventually produce fruit. To grow the exact same fruit the Wani produces in Bali, 
Richard and Norris will need to find a way to graft a Wani branch to one of their existing mango trees. It took us 15 to 20 years to figure out what's the one mangifera species that we can use as an interstock. With some difficult species, they sometimes use a third branch to help form a healthy graft. I've failed with the mangifera species for 20 years. Okay, I've had 20 years of great experience at failing. I don't like to fail, okay? I'm a bad loser. For this Bali expedition, there is a very big threat that we won't get what we want. We may not find the tree that's in the right state. We may not be able to get the material and keep it alive long enough. There is nothing worse to me than going out, having the wonderful expedition, going, having all the culture and everything, bringing something back and then watching it die. That's the worst thing in the world. For Richard and Norris to succeed in growing a Wani mango, they'll have to find a Wani tree in Bali's dense forests. Fruit hunters often find themselves becoming fruit obsessives. We have a small place of about one-fifth of one acre, but it is a tropical fruit tree jungle. We trimmed big trees, and um, he trimmed the trees, and I was the dragon lady. She would drag it out. I would drag it out and put it in the trailer <laughs> to take to the dump. We have a lot of fun. We, we laugh a lot, and we say, are the neighbors listening? <laughs> the passion for fruit sometimes leads people to go beyond their backyards. Following clues from a Balinese market where they've discovered a Wani mango, Richard and Norris work with Buddy to track down the location of the tree. Before they can touch it, the tree must be properly blessed according to Balinese tradition. Okay, I don't have to go all the way top and get the fruit. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Booty, I have a question. So the ants on this, are they particularly uh, unfun or are they relatively gentle? Okay, Richard, go Richard. Here we go! <laughs> In Bali, the wani is prized for its flavor and fiberless sweet white flesh. But it's nearly non-existent outside of a small pocket of Southeast Asia. With the fruit threatened by deforestation, Richard and Norris believe it's important that they bring home a living sample. Now here, all the buds breaking are all bloom. Can you get one of those flowers for me, please, Richard? Yeah, I will. Just gonna have to hold on. Hey, Booty's friendly insects are introducing themselves to me. When you're in the boughs of a mango tree, it's like being in your mother's arms. Oh. Sorry. Okay, now I'm gonna get a piece of budwood. Whenever I collect budwood, something that is uh, hard to graph. I try to get something up at the very highest part because up here it has full light and it's full of energy. Perfect. Every time Richard and Norris collect a fruit branch, they know that the tree it came from might not be there the next time they visit. Good job. Even though it's fun to come hunting and looking for mangoes, we have to get them into a, a collection where they're protected, where there is, uh, you know, the, if something happens, um, if, the, if somebody offers somebody too much money for that tree out there for lumber, if it's worth more than lumber than for fruit, it's gone. So um, we will put it in our genetic collections where it'll live on forever. A piece of a tree is immortal. They can go for 
these can carry on for thousands of years and and just remember we've we've failed for 20 years so we can only get better they may have secured the necessary genetic material from the wani tree but the real challenge lies ahead wrapped in protective parafilm the precious branches will only live for several days. They must be kept alive until they can be grafted back in Florida, 16,000 kilometers away. While native fruits grow wild in Bali, Hawaii is a human-made fruit paradise. It's a special place for fruit hunters. 120 years ago, the kingdom was overthrown by pineapple tycoons. But the pineapple wasn't indigenous to Hawaii. Very few fruit are. The combination of climate and rich volcanic soil makes it an ideal place to cultivate fruit. Immigrants and settlers from all over the world brought plants with them, overrunning the natural ecology but turning the island chain into a fruit-filled Garden of Eden. It might, it might be a Seville-type orange. You see something like this, and I, I mean, it's reminiscent of type of Citron or Buddha's hand. Ken Love first visited Hawaii 25 years ago. Entranced by the fruit he saw and tasted, he quit his job as a news photographer and moved to Kona. What he found there was an island paradise where tropical fruits grow in abundance and yet where most people buy expensive produce from the mainland. Ken Love's mission is to educate his neighbors about the treasures that grow in their backyards and show them how they can become fruit hunters themselves. I've never had my. You want to try? Come on. Oh, oh yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Even there. Just give them to me in a second. <laughs> Once you've experienced quality, I mean, I, there is no way in hell I can go back into a grocery store and buy a, an imported avocado. You know? I, mean, oh, I yeah. just yeah. cannot do it because I've had real ones, you know, from the backyard. Ken loves to take people on fruit hunts, like his friend film actor and fruit obsessive, Bill Pullman. And then I think what we're going to do is go in the hard way. So hang on to your fillings. What was that? One of the Back to the Future movies, you know? Roads. Where we're going, we don't need roads. Oh, we're going to go straight? Yeah. This is less than a year, wow. this road. I just hope there wasn't a lava tube that opened up here in the last for me, Bill, this is the ultimate in fruit hunting. I mean, I'm just glad I know the guy that owns the land because I don't want to get shot. Oh, beautiful. Look at that color. Huh? A little tart. Hmm? A little tart, yeah. Little but this is, this is perfect for processing. Fruit hunting with Ken Love is like getting a tour of Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. I don't know why they call this ice cream bean. I think they should really call it cotton candy bean. Yeah. This is water apple, uh, Cisitium oh. aquium. This is an incredible fruit. This is given to women after childbirth in Malaysia. There's three essential fruit that you need in Hawaii. One is a breadfruit, and then there's one peanut butter fruit, and then this is blackberry jam fruit. <laughs> that is just weird. an oddity. I'll dig in. Just dig in and... Mmm, mm, kind of pudding. Mm -hmm. Years ago, before the locavore trend swept North America, Ken created an initiative meant to bring together Hawaiian farmers and chefs. You know, I gotta give Ken. You know. He's the man, he's the yeah, fruit guru. Right. Fruit guru. <laughs> I, used to, I used to 
see him in the parking lot at the, you know, one of the shopping centers. Hey, chef, chef, come on, you got to try this. He's in town, he's doing some shopping. Chef baby him, chef baby him. I'm like, what, what the heck? <laughs> and I look, and here's Kenny, he's running across. Come on, you got to come to my car. And he opens his trunk, and he's got your and sapote, and all this. I don't, I didn't even know what that was at the time. But the problem is how many tons fall to the ground here, and we still, we yeah. not we, yeah. but the, the island continues to import from California. So our mission here is to become more sustainable, and you know, and uh, it's the right thing to do on a lot of levels, right? From the plant to the plate, it tastes better. When you buy things in season, the flavor's better. They're picked when they're ripe. It doesn't have the negative impact on the environment. It's, it's better for the economy, the local economy. And, 13, 15 years later, we're in, a, we're in a very good place now. Ensuring a future for rare fruit isn't just about growing it. The public needs to develop an appetite so that everyone becomes a bit of a fruit hunter. For fruit hunters, Fruit is more than just food. It's a deep personal connection. It is a lot of work. What I get out of it is the satisfaction of you actually get the fruit of your labor. You walk around and you know you marvel as to, you know, this was just a little plant like uh, like the lukma that I had planted about three years ago, and it was about this tall. It was a grafted lukma, and now it's probably just over two feet tall, and it started to flower. With living samples of the rare white mango tree in hand, Richard and Norris head for the airport. Bringing seeds or seedlings back is illegal, but these living branches, once crafted to rootstock, will be able to produce the exact same fruit they found in Bali. But first, they must face the nerve-rattling journey home. All their work will be for nothing if they can't get the branches through customs, where plants are scrutinized for pests and disease. We have the, the, the different, different materials separated. Officially speaking, there's going to be no problem. They should let it go. So the worst case scenario is there's no one to inspect it and they destroy it. And they can do it. They have the right to do it if they decide anything. The worst case would be if they found something on it, right? They found uh, some sort of a quarantine pest. It's like I lose one of my children. It's terrible. It's, you know, you suffer, you sweat to get it. Finally, you get to your final destination, your target, and is to have a tree alive growing in our collection and so the tree is gone. It's one thing to go out. We saw them, we get excited. We, we love to see them out here growing, but getting them back into the ground, growing, fruiting, that's the key. We leave no budwood behind. We leave, leave no one behind. We're just like the Marines, all right? I will miss you Thank lot. you for so much. I will miss you a lot. We'll take care of your material, OK? okay. Thank you. Thank you, please. Thank you. Back in the States, they successfully clear U.S. customs. Richard and Norris race home to the Fairchild Farm, where they must graft the branches onto their mango rootstock as soon as possible. We cannot afford to wait another day to get that material propagated. So we have to come right away, no matter how tired you are, and you have to propagate them, because you have better chances if you do it earlier than later. Grafting's one part science, one part superstition, throw in feelings. You gotta be fresh, basically. That makes a huge difference because this is really where the rubber meets the road for what we do. You can't have a Balinese Wani from any other way.
Hopefully that's going to do it. We need just one. A piece of branch has everything that you need to make exactly the same tree. And that is magic for me. With some luck, the Wani tree will thrive in its new home. In their journey to preserve it, Richard and Norris are tapping into a deep human instinct to experience biophilia, or love of living systems. That's what sends them out again and again to discover and share a diversity that is as limitless as it is fragile. It's a feeling that defines us as a species. Biophilia is on full display every year at the Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden's annual mango auction. Fruit hunters from all over the world obsess over a selection of mangoes of every color, shape and taste, selected from the Fairchild's huge collection. All proceeds go to benefit the Fairchild's tropical fruit program. When you see all these movements, um, people trying to do good things, base it in a fruit, it's hope. And then some of those were done in... Actually, these came, we have these on agreement with the Israeli government. We're trying to help maintain these genetic resources for the people of this planet. That's our job. Non è la varietà, è tutto questo mondo che c'era intorno, tutto questo sapere che c'era intorno alle varietà di frutta. Dunque questo è un, è un racconto, è un rapporto umano. Maybe that's part of it, it, it triggers these memories that we had as a child or special moments in our lives and maybe that's part of the allure of uh, or the addiction of, of, of being into this tropical fruit so much. Fruit's incredible diversity is all around us, whether you live in Hawaii or Canada. You may have to look further than the supermarket aisles, but it's there. There are even urban fruit hunters searching for treasures in their own backyards. All you need to awaken that desire for diversity is to try something fresh, sweet, or strange. Perhaps we're all fruit hunters at heart. We just have to take that first bite.